The Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, is one of the most important climate systems on Earth and a key indicator of the health of our ocean. But is it in danger of decline? In this special mini-series from the creators of the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast, we speak to a range of experts to get to the bottom of the AMOC's potential decline and what we can do to stop it. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr Zoe Jacobs and in the first episode of our series all about the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, otherwise known as the AMOC, uh, I'm joined by Ollie Tooth today to discuss what it is and why it matters to our climate. So, hi Ollie, thank you so much for being here today. Um, So, can you start by telling us a bit about your career background? Um, You're doing your PhD at the moment, right? Yeah, so I'm in the last uh, year of my PhD, not too long left. Um, So I have come from an undergraduate in meteorology and oceanography. Um, So I did that in UEA in Norwich Mm -hmm. uh, and then went from there to start my PhD in Oxford, um, where I work with um, Helen Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, we study um, how uh, the large scale ocean works by following water parcels uh, Mm -hmm. in ocean models. So we effectively study how and where they go and also how they give up their heat to the atmosphere. Cool. Um, And do you work specifically on the AMOC? Uh, Yeah, that's the main part that I work Mm -hmm. on. So I work on it in uh, both the uh, subtropical, so kind of the um, part of the Atlantic, which is um, between Florida and over to Mm -hmm. Africa. So that region there where we have an observing system uh, and also then much higher up. So that's typically where about our latitude. So where the UK is um, and where we have an observing system there as well. So both of those parts um, that we we look at in, in my research. Nice. Um, So I guess a good place to start, really, is probably by explaining to our listeners what exactly the AMOC is. Yeah, so (laughs) it's um, it's quite quite a complicated thing to explain sometimes. But in essence, the really simple view of the AMOC is it's a large system of ocean currents Mm -hmm. which all work together to transport warm and relatively salty water from the subtropical regions um, all the way up to the high northern latitudes. So where we are and even higher, where it can then go and be cooled and freshened and then become really dense Mm -hmm. at that point it sinks and then comes back and it effectively completes the loop so you've got that full set of circulation like that um the amoc um at the moment then (laughs) the moment force um another way i suppose a well way of framing it is um to think of it a little bit like uh, the central heating system mm-hmm. where you've got uh, the equi- near the equator it's a lot warmer so it's a bit like a boiler so mm-hmm. we've got a real a surplus of heat mm-hmm. and then the job of all the pipes or in this case the ocean currents is to redistribute that and take it further north yeah uh, and so from our point of view we benefit from that because that heat once it comes further north is released back to the atmosphere yeah. and so we find that our climate here in europe mm-hmm. is typically between somewhere between three and seven degrees degrees warmer on average as a result of the ocean moving all this heat further north so it's really valuable to us yeah i see um that makes sense because i've heard it called like the ocean conveyor belt before things like that yeah so the amog um when it's kind of become famous from the 90s where there's a lot of work looking at past climate so really even back to medieval times and periods Mm -hmm. like that where we use um sort of proxies of of the climate system you can't measure it exactly so we use ways to indirectly get at the climate where there's been there was a lot of evidence to suggest that there were periods where the amog um would completely shut off in the past and that had massive climate effects so plunging areas of Europe into what was called the the, the Little Ice Age, so really drastic changes in temperature. Um, And that's where this idea of a conveyor belt model came from, quite a simple idea. Mm. Um, It's a little bit more complicated than that when we look at it now. Um, And The last 30 years have really changed how we think about it because actually, as I said at the start, there's lots of these currents Mm. that all together make up what we call the AMOC. And that means processes happening on tiny spatial scales all the way up to across the whole ocean basin are included in what we mean by AMOC as as a concept. Cool. And there is a lot of research that goes into it, right? Um, And you've kind of just touched a little bit on it there, but like, why do we care about it so much? Yeah, so I suppose from the perspective of people in Europe, the selfish point of view is Mm -hmm. is its role in the climate system and how much heat it brings north. Mm -hmm. Um, That in terms of, if you try to follow it through, so obviously from a 
a general climate perspective, it does give us a warmer climate than what we'd have if there was not that heat coming yeah. northwards. But then it's also worth thinking about what it does in terms of the extremes okay. as well. So if we think about that, the way we've discovered this is by actually shutting it off artificially in models. Mm -hmm. And when we turn off the AMOC in models, then we find that actually the, we get really strong seasonal extremes. So for example, in summer months, we tend to find it a lot becomes a lot drier mm -hmm. in, in Europe, um, in increasing risks of drought and, mm -hmm. and areas like that. Um, whereas then if you look in the winter months, what you see is that AMOC is really closely coupled to the storm track that in the UK we all kind of know and love because of it bringing these low pressure systems that are really do, kind of... Do we love it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, not at the moment. We, no. But so you, when we think about those kind of cold weather events, yeah. you, you're thinking of real rain, like strong rainfall. Yeah. Um, and in particular, if you shut off your AMOC, you see that those cold weather events and their impacts, mm -hmm. particularly onto kind of infrastructure, the energy system and agriculture, they would all have a massive impact. So we do all kind of rely on it. And a lot of the yeah. time, I think we probably take it a bit for granted yeah. in, in, in our lives um, in Europe. Yeah, it does have a bigger effect around the world as well. Okay. Um, so obviously being very kind of European centric there, but if you think more broadly, um, there are parts of North Africa which are very much dependent on the AMOC sort of second hand okay. um, because of the fact that it moderates how dry their climate is and therefore massive impacts on agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so going forward, that's a real risk factor because if mm -hmm. you have areas where you can't grow crops anymore, then you of course set up the possibility of migration, so yeah. environmental refugees. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just a, a, a European kind of uh, phenomenon in terms of how we benefit. It is much broader than that. There are lots of parts of the world more vulnerable than ourselves to climate change, which yeah. rely on what the AMOC does. Yeah. Fundamentally. Yeah. So, I mean, it spans the whole Atlantic, right? But yeah. as you say, not just Atlantic countries that can get impacted. Yeah. It can cause impacts globally. Yeah, 100%. And there's, there's also increasing evidence that it might also impact the Asian monsoon as well. Mm, yeah. um, so there's a kind of distant phenomenon where, of course, with a much larger population than what we have in Europe, impacts there are felt mm. by uh, much more many, m yeah, much more people. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Definitely. Um, okay, so how, how do we go about measuring the AMOC? It sounds like quite a complicated task. Yes, yeah, so it is pretty difficult. And if you think back to that kind of analogy of this central heating system, uh, th that's trying to measure how your, effective your central heating system is at home is quite a difficult mm. thing to do. The way you do it in the ocean is effectively we try and p find a portion of the Atlantic where we can set up in an observing sense um, an array which will go all the way across the basin. Mm -hmm. So that way we put moorings uh, which are effectively um, instruments which can tell us about the properties of the ocean and also the current speeds of the ocean yeah. across the section. And we need, fundamentally, we need two things. We need to know how much water is actually flowing northward. So that is done with the currents themselves. We me measure the current speeds. Mm -hmm. We also need to know the properties of that water as well. So if we want to understand how much heat the ocean is transporting, we also need to know about its temperature as well and also its salinity. So we measure those across a section like mm -hmm. that, which goes up from one coast to the other. So yeah. the, the well-known one um, would be from all the way from Florida to North Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and from that, then the, we basically take all of that data and we turn it into one number. And that number is telling us how much warm light water is flowing northwards, mm -hmm. which is balanced by that cold, dense water flowing yeah. south, okay. and so it's effectively telling us how what the rate of that cold, uh, warm to l from warm to light yeah. uh, to cold to dense is uh, being transformed. That's what it's telling us um, as, yeah. a, as an overall measure. Yeah, cool. So you've got that array, and is that that's called the rapid array, right? Yeah, that's the rapid yeah. array. Yeah, and there's quite a lot of others now as well. So the rapid array is quite famous. It was, it was the first. Yeah. Um, so that was in place from 2004, and mm. it's still giving us results now. Yeah. Um, that's where the amount of heat being transported north is at its highest. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why it was put in place first. But now we have measurements that happen um, right up at kind of our latitudes. Mm -hmm. So we have what's called the OSNAP array, mm -hmm. so overturning in the subpolar North Atlantic yeah. program, <laughs> um, and that that measures basically um the um amount of water that's being transformed um between so uh canada uh, across to um greenland and then greenland across to, to scotland so that gives us a real sense of what's happening at our latitudes mm. but there are also arrays all the way into yeah. the south atlantic as well so all of those are measuring the strength of this circulation at the same time mm. um and will do so hopefully into the future yeah uh, i hope well. we can continue measuring because it sounds really yeah. important um so we touched on how important the AMOC is for the climate. Um, how does it translate to society? Um, what kind of impacts can the AMOC have on us day to day? Yeah, so this is um, 
this is where it becomes quite interesting to actually kind of explore when I mentioned about before about the climate system and thinking about the what the impacts mean uh, in terms of so two really good examples I think are uh, agriculture and energy mm-hmm. particularly if we take a UK focus yeah. so the we depend on our current climate now for for um, obviously agriculture and both in terms of production but also in terms of food security yeah. and some of the experiments I mentioned earlier where they've artificially they've just turned off the AMOC they've seen changes of up to 50 percent in terms of a reduction in the amount of primary um, production how much food we can produce Mm -hmm. and also uh, up to 10 percent reduction in like the the profitability in effect of agriculture but then something that's kind of more thematic at the moment is about energy Mm -hmm. um, because of obviously large global factors but having periods where you've got really um, strong um, winter time events like um, we've seen some in in recent years um, that's got a major impact in terms of where we get our energy from mm-hmm. demand spikes in demand going forward uh, and so understanding how the AMAC will impact winter weather yeah. um, is really important in terms of energy infrastructure and also obviously our reliance on UK mm. energy versus overseas mm. so that both of those have an impact in terms of day-to-day in terms of what we experience in our in our pocket fundamentally mm. in terms of what we spend money on yeah. um, so the AMOC is fundamentally baked into to how we operate in society yeah. Yeah. daily lives yeah Cool. Um, So one of the current big questions in ocean science is, will the AMOC collapse in the coming years? Um, I was kind of wondering whether to bring this up or not, but there is a film that came out a while ago called The Day After Tomorrow. Yeah. (laughs) And it's kind of the favourite scaremongering, what happens if this thing collapses? Um, Now, I'm assuming that was a bit dramatic for what the reality would be (laughs) yeah very dramatic kind of very extreme examples um a little bit non-physical in places as well (laughs) um but the idea of a collapse um does come from this kind of the the view i mentioned from the historical perspective where we've seen the amoc cause really abrupt climate change in, in the past According to the latest reports, the IPCC that does work on this, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, they say that the um, lo- the risk of the AMOC collapsing by 2100 is very unlikely. Mm. However, there's always caveats with these things, which is these are fundamentally built on, on models, so computer yeah. models and predicting the climate. Yeah. And so there is some concern about how well we actually represent it, but at the moment it's very unlikely. With that said, we do, we're, we're, we're sure that, that there will be a weakening. In the historical period, there has been a weakening. We know that with medium confidence. But looking ahead to 2050 and even beyond, it's very likely that there will then start to, we, we will see a weakening going forward. And that is, and this is the challenge, I think, for AMOC science as a whole at the moment. Those estimates range quite a lot yeah. from around 30 to about 45% weakening by 2100. So... The weakening part's not necessarily a massive debate, but collapse mm. and the major consequences is something that we're we're much, much less certain about yeah. and think is very unlikely overall. Yeah. And this kind of complete shutdown, which you did mention earlier, um, we're talking like hundreds to thousands and probably millions of years ago about um for example, the Little Ice Age was that in the 1700s? The, those are 1300s no. and then 1500s like, yeah. around those times. So hundreds of years ago, yeah, um, something like this did happen. But how quickly did it happen? Because we're talking about abrupt climate change, and like in the film, it like yeah, suddenly yeah. is just like off, and that's obviously not going to happen. So how long would it take to completely? shut down do we even know the answer to that so uh, yeah i would say we probably don't have a a good sense of how long that would take a lot of the processes and it's we're we're saying a lot of the processes that bring about change to the amoc are areas that are under real active Mm -hmm. research now particularly so the big threat to the amoc fundamentally is is arctic sea ice melt and also greenland land melt places and both of those things we we know because we have an understanding from kind of a historical period Mm -hmm. will impact the way that this water is is turned from that warm and saline to, to cold and, and, and fresh yeah. um, but the exact way it does that is something that we're still actively exploring and a lot of the time it's because the models that we use are constantly being improved mm. and they're adding new processes in all the time to try and understand and improve the way we represent yeah. it so that's one of the major reasons mm-hmm. i would say um, that it's fairly un- unsure at the moment yeah. as to yeah how it will exactly um, so i guess the reason that we're seeing a weakening is because 
there's a lot more meltwater coming off uh, around the Arctic at the moment with climate change. So that is, that is why we're worried. Yeah, so the fundamental, yeah, the reason we're worried is, and that has been consistent even in those historical yes. examples as well, the yeah. mechanism there is, is kind of semi well understood, I'd yeah. say, in the sense of what we're talking about is a reduction in the amount of that warm saline water coming mm. north because it's not being able to be transformed into the colder dense water at these high yeah. northern latitudes the question we have uh, going forward i think to try and deal with is sort of whether the time scales over which that happens and also where if we have large really large changes in fresh water in the arctic for example how quickly do those changes mm. travel down to the north atlantic and then what does it impact first in terms of is it reducing the amount of warm salty water coming north or is it changing that tr that transformation as it goes from warm um, yeah. to cold as it loses its heat those bits are a little bit more unsure and that's what we're a lot of people are work spending a lot of time working on yeah because it's so, such a pressing issue yeah absolutely um and you mentioned so on this um in the rapid array in particular yeah. i remember in was it 2010 or 2011 everyone suddenly started getting worried because it took a massive kind of nose dive didn't yeah. it? it weakened quite a lot and everyone was panicking but it turned out give it a few more years it was maybe a bit of decadal variability yeah so how do we know or how long how long are we gonna have to measure for before we know if it's actually weakening or if we're just looking at kind of yeah. decadal vari variation so that is a really really important question i think it comes down to almost the philosophy of studying the amoc as well yeah. which is to provide some context, that, that kind of circulation loop we mentioned, which is taking stuff from all the way through the Atlantic, we think that it takes a water parcel about a thousand years to do that. So oh, it's right, a very, right. very long time. Yeah. And so for a long time with the conveyor belt view, we kind of thought about it as if you make a change at the high northern latitudes, so put loads of fresh water in, then it would have a knock-on effect all the way down mm. like, like a conveyor belt yeah. would. But actually what we find when we observe the AMOC out in places like um, it was rapid in the subtropics mm. is that the signal we get is really noisy. And it's okay. because we're not just measuring what we call the AMOC, mm -hmm. we're measuring lots of other things. Yeah. And it's worth also at this point saying that a common mis misnomer, if you will, is that the AMOC and the Gulf Stream are the same thing. Yeah. And so the Gulf Stream, t it comes from, it's a wind driven circulation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that will always be there, it's worth saying. Um, but the Gulf Stream does then transport water, which uh, as part of the AMOC as well. So this is really quite hard thing to pull apart. And so when we have these observing arrays, you're measuring multiple processes at once yeah. and collapsing them all into this number. So when we see a weakening, we've got some of the AMOC in there, but we've also got some other changes as well. And so one of the lessons from the rapid program is just how much of this kind of short term variability can make finding long term signals really difficult. Mm. Um, and that proves to still to be a problem. Yeah. You need a longer record effectively to find those trends. Um, yeah. Hence, there's an incentive to keep observing that. Exactly. In the future. And let's hope. That yeah, that yeah exactly. Let's hope, <laughs> we, let's hope we continue to do, to do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so if we do start seeing a weakening um, in the coming decades, what are the kind of impacts that we can expect to see? Yeah, so if we take the UK as a, as a good example yeah. of this, um, we tend to think about it uh, in terms of, I um, mentioned before about a, a, an overall, um, you, we would expect a cooling. Mm -hmm. So we stop bringing that heat further north. Mm -hmm. So depending on kind of your estimates, it would be order of several degrees, which okay. would be an overall cooling. Mm -hmm. But then there's some uncertainty as to whether that will mask the overall warming that yeah. we associate with climate change. In other words, it's taking a delayed amount of time for us to see that. When you get to specific seasons, that's when you start to see quite big changes in the mm. sense of increased risk of drought. So drier summers mm. is one thing that we, we um, have some confidence over. But then also one of the big impacts that the AMOC has as a knock on is changing the storm track. So that is how storms arrive um, at, in the UK and across yeah. northern Europe. And the sense is that it would be likely become stormier as the AMOC weakens. So that means okay. some of the wintertime impacts, that localised rainfall, particularly mm -hmm. over on that west coast, which is obviously more exposed, we would expect then a lot more rainfall during those events. And so you can imagine already just from recent experience, the knock on effect of that in terms mm. of flooding yeah. and how and how that could be an impact as well so there's quite a lot of impacts from the amoc that almost come to us yeah. um the secondary effects yeah. as it impacts the extremes of uk weather and yeah. also european weather as well yeah gosh very integrated like yeah it's hard to process. unpick them yeah. all yeah it's a lot going on <laughs> yeah um so what are the most important scientific questions that you think need to be answered by the amoc community over the next few decades 
Yeah, so I had a lot of thinking about this before coming in. And, and one of the main ones, I think, is whether or not uh, asking the question of what drives the AMOC today mm -hmm. yeah. is the same as what's going to change it in the future. Yeah. They're, they're quite distinctly different questions. And we kind of touched a little bit earlier on what could change in the future. We have a pretty good sense that the f impacts of fresh water are going to be really important. Mm -hmm. But we need to really focus in, I think, as a community on what those are and working out, because we've got lots of computer simulations yeah. now, how we can really kind of work out the which bits we're certain about there and yeah. where there's real areas of uncertainty yeah. it's worth saying that the AMOC is now it, it's, as we stand one of the key areas of uncertainty yeah. in future climate prediction yeah. because it's just so poorly constrained mm. which has a knock-on impact to those effects yeah, so that's one of the main things is to try and kind of focus on what the process of change is yeah the other is then the other things kind of fall from that which is for observing are we looking to observe the ocean in terms of where is it most likely to change so where's yeah. your kind of fingerprint if yeah. you will of AMOC change so we obviously have our array at 26 uh, and a half degrees north which is the rapid array mm -hmm. but then are, is there anywhere else or any other methods we can use to try and pick up a, an early warning signal of AMOC change mm -hmm. that's there's a huge amount of uh, effort going into that now and in the coming years and then from the modeling point of view I think you can take the, the, the same view which is kind of what are the pro minimum processes that we need to represent really well do a good job of including in our models in order for the AMOC to uh, and its prediction to be to improve so yeah. we can reduce the uncertainty yeah. I think coming decades that will be a real drive for everyone yeah. and um, knowing the community as well that is a, a real focus going forward yeah I bet um something I was wondering as well um there's a little almost like a buzzword going around at the moment tipping points yeah so if this if the AMOC does, we can substantially, possibly not collapse, obviously, but yeah. we can substantially. Is this something that can be reversible or once it's once it's gone, no matter how much mitigation we are putting into place, it's not going to come back or will it come back? Yeah. Do so the, the tipping points question is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so the the idea of a tipping point being when basically a part of the the climate system can change from one stable state to another yeah. and it doesn't that would be irreversible yeah. in in that in that definition and so when we think about shutdown historically we do know it's reversed so we do know that those changes can be mm -hmm. reversed on very long time scales yeah. but in the present day context we we we, we, we think it's very unlikely that it mm. will collapse and so therefore change state dramatically yeah. so th at the moment the sense of a strong weakening when a lot of studies have been done mm. um, and they show that there is a then a slow recovery yeah. in effect but the key thing is we are in control of that future yeah. in the sense of it we can mitigate that and reduce global uh, carbon dioxide emissions and yeah. others and um, and actually reduce uh, risks of what is a plausible albeit very unlikely outcome which is a, a collapse of the yeah. AMOC much more likely as we would see this reduction yeah. Um, yeah. going forward into the future yeah cool um, okay so finally yeah. um, and I'll be asking everyone in the series <laughs> this question so what needs to happen to protect the AMOC in the coming decades yeah, so I suppose the straightforward answer is a little bit like what I just said, which is I think uh, kind of the level of uh, national level and governance mm -hmm. is about really focusing on yeah. our impacts on the global climate as a, mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, and obviously act, behaving more sustainably is clearly one is a really important part. Um, but in terms of the community and how we communicate, I think that's another really important component of this, which is actually taking AMOC science from something done by oceanographers mm -hmm. to a much more interdisciplinary mm -hmm. approach. So we've talked a lot about how the physical climate uh, impacts of the AMOC then translate into yeah. people's lives, mm -hmm. agriculture and, 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 and such. But actually, more when, when looking into this, you find that there's actually not a lot of information about mm -hmm. that. There's not many instances where we've gone from a future AMOC weakening at different levels and translated that into what the economics and what the social consequences are so for me the big bit is the big kind of aim now is for the community to work with other scientists mm -hmm. and in different specialisms to try and really communicate the value of the AMOC in a way that policymakers that are looking to produce a more sustainable equitable world yeah. can actually understand yeah. and do something with yeah. beyond just the science element that we have today yeah. great well thank you very much no for worries. joining us today thank you so much for having me to find out more about Knox research into the AMOC or to check out the other episodes from this mini-series, visit our website, knock.ac.uk. If you'd like to listen to more of our podcasts, both seasons of Into the Blue are available on our YouTube channel on all major podcast platforms. See you next time.